Pozdravljeni in lep dober večer vsem in hvala, da ste prišli na predavanje profesorja Adriana Johnstona. Moje ime je Boštjan Nedoh, prihajam iz, kot velika večina verjetno že veste, iz Filozofskega inštituta in bom danes pač odmoderiral nakratko tole predavanje. Kot rečeno, hvala, da ste prišli, hvala za obisk. Predavanje bo potekalo v angliškem jeziku in tudi kratka predstavitev Adriana jo bom pač odpovedal, napovedal v angliščini. Tako da mogoče bi zdaj kar nakratko prišel k eni krajši predstavitvi današnjega predavatelja. So, let's switch to English. Um, thank you, Adrian, for, for being here. Um, Adrian Johnston is distinguished professor in the Department of Philosophy at the University of New Mexico at Albuquerque and a faculty member at the Emory Psychoanalytic Institute in Atlanta. He's the author of many books, including Time Driven, Metapsychology, Metapsychology and the Splitting of the Drive, Zizek's Ontology, a transcendal, Transcendental Materialist Theory of Subjectivity, then Badiou, Zizek and Political Transformations, Decadence of Change, and then Prolegomena to Any Future Materialism, Volume 1, The Outcome of Contemporary French Philosophy. This is from 2013. All these books were published by Northwestern University Press. Uh, then he is also the author of Adventures in Transcendental Materialism, Dialogues with Contemporary Thinkers, published by Edinburgh University Press in 2014. Uh, he is also a co-author of an important book um, written together with Catherine Malabu. Uh, the book is titled Self and Emotional Life, Philosophy, Psychoanalysis and Neuroscience and it was published by Columbia University Press in 2013. While his most recent books are, um, well, yeah, The Irrepressible Truth on Lacan's The Freudian Thing, published by Paul Gravy Macmillan in 2017, belongs to a series on uh, dedicated Lacan on Lacan. Uh, then the next one, it's A New German Idealism, Hegel, Zizek, and Dialectical Materialism, published by Columbia University Press in 2018, and Prolegomena to Any Future Materialism, Volume 2, A Weak Nature Alone. It's uh, 500 pages, something like that. Big, uh, large volume, uh, published in 2019 by uh, Northwestern University Press. Um, where he is also, um, to catch the chance, uh, a co-editor co of a series, uh, Diaresis, uh, co-edited with Todd McGowan and uh, Slava Zizek. Um, and yeah, uh, well, most recently he also co-edited with me. Uh, I must admit it was a great pleasure to work with you on that project with me and Alenka Zupancic. Um, an edited collection, Objective Fictions, Philosophy, Psychoanalysis, Marxism, uh, published this year uh, in January by Edinburgh University Press. And well, regarding maybe, I mean, to make a list substantially long enough, um, you are now working on two different books project. Yes. Among, among other things. Yes. Uh, so one is uh, a book um, uh, co-authored with Lorenzo Chiesa. Which one? Oh, so yeah, with Lorenzo, uh, you're writing a book, uh, God is Undead, Psychoanalysis Between Agnosticism and Atheism. And correct me if I'm wrong, you are advocating a atheist position vis-a-vis -vis agnosticism. Pos Agnosticist position uh, advocated by Lorenzo, uh, which uh, yeah we probably all looking forward to to read it. This kind of yeah, co-written but still polemical text. Um, and last but not least, uh, the book Infinite Greed, uh, 
money in Marxism and psychoanalysis that is, um, well, yeah, in the process of publication with uh, Columbia University uh, Press. It's an almost 800 pages uh, volume. Adrian admitted it's uh, the longest uh, thing I, he's ever written. So we also look forward um, to, to, to read this uh, book as well. Uh, and today's lecture is titled, uh, yeah, I, I, I recall right you now, <laughs> yes. Communism and Aggression, uh, Marx, uh, no, sorry, Marxism, Freud, and Aggression. aggression. Uh, and it's basically, it's an extract uh, from a couple of chapters from the book, uh, The Infinite Grid, which is to be published anytime soon by Sorry. Columbia University Press. So thank you, Adrian, for being with us, and the floor is all yours. Well, to begin with, I would like to th thank Bastien not only for his incredibly kind introduction, but for being instrumental in organizing my visit here. It has been a great pleasure becoming close friends with him over the years as we've collaborated on a number of projects, and I've had the pleasure of being able to host him several times in Albuquerque at the University of New Mexico. I also would like to thank everyone here at the Institute for so kindly hosting me. And uh, thus far, I've been here a week uh, with my son and we've had a thoroughly enjoyable time. Uh, and so we are deeply grateful to all of you. It is also a joy to be back in Ljubljana. I was last here almost exactly 11 years ago. Uh, and between that and then of course the pandemic, uh, returning here feels like reclaiming a vital part of my life that uh, I had been disconnected from for a while. Um, and it has been lovely seeing dear old friends as well as making new ones. So as uh, Bustian indicated, um, this text is a bit of material from the Infinite Greed manuscript and material that I, this part I haven't published anywhere and haven't had a chance to try out with an audience yet, so this will be the first test run of it. Um, and one thing that I wanted to indicate before I get well and truly underway is that um, in preparing this in the past couple of days, the, the abstract that was circulated in advance um, indicated that there would be both Marxist pushback against Freud's criticisms of Marxism as well as psychoanalytic critical considerations vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Marx and the Marxist traditions. Um, but in the interest of time, given that I needed to cut some material, I will focus more on the side of playing devil's advocate on behalf of Marx a contra some of Freud's criticisms that Freud articulates um, starting in the late 1920s, early 1930s. So, <clears throat> two major historical developments run parallel to each other during the late 19-teens and early 1920s. The Bolshevik Revolution of October 1917 with its protracted aftermath and an interlinked set of fundamental shifts in Freud's ideas involving both his topography of the psychical apparatus as well as his account of drives. Moreover, Freud, during this pivotal period in the evolution of his psychoanalytic thinking, sees fit to reflect upon these contemporaneous political events transpiring in Russia. The first and most famous of Freud's remarks upon Bolshevism occur in 1930's Civilization and its Discontents. This widely read book by the later Freud centrally involves redeploying the relatively new theory of the death drive first introduced a decade earlier in Beyond the Pleasure Principle. Civilization and its Discontents focuses on those dimensions of the Todestrieb associated with aggression with destructiveness as directed by human beings against each other. For this Freud, the death drive as aggression poses the greatest permanent threat to the very existence of civilization. In this vein, he signals his sympathy with one of the most unmarxist of worldviews, namely 
Hobbes's political philosophy according to which human beings are naturally in the supposed state of nature, isolated selfish predators preying on each other. Freud joins Hobbes in repeating Plautus's man is a wolf to man. In Civilization and its Discontents, immediately after endorsing man being a wolf to man via the hypothesis of a naturalized aggression, that is an innate todestrieb, Freud turns his attention to revolutionary Russia. He begins by attributing to quote unquote communists a crude Rousseauian vision, having it that quote, man is wholly good and is well disposed to his neighbor but the institution of private property has corrupted his nature, end quote. Whether Marx's own conception of human nature, as Gattungswesen, as essentially linked to social laboring, requires disavowing aggression, evil, viciousness, selfishness, and the like, as Freud charges, is highly debatable. What is more, Marx emphatically rejects all forms of the state of nature myth, whether Hobbesian, Rousseauian, or any other permutation. Freud appears to be relying more on propaganda for his image of communism than on a careful consideration of the actual textual basis of Marxism. Freud promptly proceeds to attack what he takes to be communist belief in a lost but recoverable original goodness purportedly lying at the historically eclipsed basis of human nature. After admitting his lack of qualifications for assessing the economic feasibility and desirability of implementing a Marxist approach to political economy, he asserts apropos Marxism that, quote, the psychological premises on which the system is based are an untenable illusion, end quote. He then warns that, quote, in abolishing private property, private eigentums, we deprive the human love of aggression of one of its instruments, certainly a strong one, though certainly not the strongest, end quote. One should note in passing Freud's admission that property is neither the unique nor the most important conduit for channeling aggression. That noted, Freud goes on to argue that aggression, both phylogenetically and ontogenetically, precedes the emergence of the institution of private property as we know it. One obvious Marxist rebuttal of Freud's line of criticism in this context is to draw attention to the crucial distinction between private property and personal possessions. When Marx speaks of private property, private eigentums, he does not thereby designate the transhistorical category of any object of ownership and this ownership's attendant claims or rights. By private property, Marx instead designates means of production intended to serve as surplus value generating capital and held by individual capitalists as members of one class among several within specifically capitalist societies. Several chapters later in Civilization and Its Discontents, Freud briefly picks back up the thread of his discussion of Bolshevism. Whether intentionally or not, he accentuates an ambivalent tone already detectable in his prior remarks regarding this subject. Apropos dealing with aggressiveness as, quote, a potent obstacle to civilization, end quote, Freud states, quote, I too think it quite certain that a real change in the relations of human beings to possessions would be of more help in this direction than any ethical commands. But the recognition of this fact among socialists has been obscured and made useless for practical purposes by a fresh idealistic misconception of human nature." End quote. It seems that Freud in this passage softens and qualifies his critique of Marxism Earlier in Civilization and Its Discontents, he appeared to assert that Marxist-type changes of wealth distribution either would fail to diffuse or even further aggravate aggression between people. 
Now, Freud instead concedes that economically egalitarian redistributions of possessions as besitz or property as eigentum indeed are, quote unquote, quite certain to result in some genuine progress in the history of society's struggles to tame and domesticate the destructive side of the death drive. And this by contrast with mere ethical admonishments of a love thy neighbor as thyself sort. Within the pages of Civilization and Its Discontents, Freud's stance regarding Marxist political economics abruptly shifts from denying it will be of any assistance against aggression to admitting that it promises real help on this front. His reservation becomes one concerning the management or lack thereof of expectations. Now, instead of denying the anti-aggression efficacy of combating material inequality, Freud simply warns against expecting too much progress along these lines from socialist or communist economic changes. After Civilization is Discontents, on two occasions published in 1933, Freud returns to the topic of Marxism. He addresses it both in the new introductory lectures on psychoanalysis, as well as in the exchange with Einstein entitled, Why War? Both of these texts from 1933 contain reiterations of Freud's 1930 objection to Marxism, according to which socialist and communist economic policies are powerless to tamp down the Todestrieb as an aggression inherent to an incorrigible human nature. However, in 1933, Freud adds further points and nuances to his considerations of Marxism not to be found in civilization and its discontents. To begin with, in the new introductory lectures on psychoanalysis, he proffers an ambivalent assessment of what he takes to be the essence of historical materialism as a conceptual framework. Therein, Freud praises Marx for discovering the previously un- or underappreciated influences of economic forces and factors on societies and the human being shaped by them. Yet, Freud qualifies this praise of Marxian historical materialism with two caveats. First, he argues against the idea that the entirety of more than economic superstructure can be reduced wholly and completely to a mere reflection of whatever constitutes the current infrastructure. With the concept of the superego in view, Freud comments, and here I would ask that you turn to the handout and see quotation number one on it. Quote, a child's superego is in fact constructed on the model, not of its parents, but of its parents' superego. The contents which fill it are the same, and it becomes the vehicle, trege, of tradition and of all the time-resisting judgments of value which have propagated themselves in this manner from generation to generation. It seems likely that what are known as materialistic views of history sin in underestimating this factor. They brush it aside with the remark that human ideologies are nothing other than the product and superstructure of their contemporary economic conditions. That is true, but very probably not the whole truth. The past, the tradition of the race and of the people, lives on in the ideologies of the superego and yields only slowly to the influences of the present and to new changes. And so long as it operates through the superego, it plays a powerful part in human life, independently of economic conditions." End quote. Already in Civilization as Discontents, Freud speaks of a quote-unquote cultural superego. However, this passage from the new introductory lectures on psychoanalysis indicates that this phrase is a pleonasm. The superego is, by metapsychological definition, inherently cultural, qua an internalization of socio-historical forms and contents transmitted primarily via the family unit. Faced with this just-quoted Freud, 
the very first thing that any Marxist worth his or her salt ought to do is point out the oversimplification of historical materialism relied upon in this quotation. Perhaps taking certain more vulgar Marxists as accurately representing the core commitments of Marxism, Freud's above remarks reveal that, as he understands it, historical materialism posits that the entirety of a given society's superstructure springs wholly out of that same society's infrastructure. This sort of superstructure, therefore, would contain no surviving traces of earlier historical periods tied to different modes of production. Such classical Marxist moments as Engels' October 27th, 1890 letter to Conrad Schmidt, in which Engels clarifies that historical materialism insists on economic determination as a matter of, quote unquote, in the last instance. Such moments warn that neither Marx nor Engels espouse a crudely simplistic doctrine according to which a single economic base generates each and every more than economic dimension and detail of society contemporaneous with this base. Hence, Freud is wrong to assume that historical materialism presupposes or posits a one and only linear causal relationship between a particular infrastructure as cause and a corresponding superstructure in its entirety as an effect of this and exclusively this particular infrastructure. Incidentally, Freud belatedly in 1937 comes to concede that his pre-1937 criticisms of Marx and Engels involving recourse to the analytic theory of the superego were ill-informed and invalid. Furthermore, Marxist questions can and should be raised about whether and how much, using Freud's own language, the ideologies of the superego really are independent of economic conditions. If Freud is willing to concede that contemporary economic conditions influence human ideologies, then why would past economic conditions not have influenced, as Freud words all of this, the tradition of the race and of the people that lives on in the ideologies of the superego? If so, then the Freudian superego would reflect a lag between the influences of at least two modes of production, one current and one or more preceding ones. But in this case, the superego would not be independent of economic conditioning. There is another Marxist line of response which this Freud would need to take into account. Specifically, how would he respond to the Marxist who, on the one hand, admits that contemporary society contains vestiges of prior social formations, while on the other hand, maintaining that these carryovers from the past are able to persist in the present only if and when they are amenable to being pressed into the service of the present socioeconomic system. Would this not indicate an infrastructural mediation, if only an indirect one, by the present mode of production of even those superstructural ghosts originating out of earlier modes of production. Also, in the 1933 block quotation above, Freud employs the German word Träger, vehicle, to characterize the superego. This is the same word Marx uses to depict individuals as vehicles or bearers of class identities and functions. In this vein, is there not ample evidence in capitalist societies of persons' superegos operating, at least in part, as vehicles or bearers for the productive and or consumptive demands of capital? Even if the cultural superego contains residues of the pre-capitalist past, it also seems to harbor fragments of the capitalist present too. It indeed would be a false dilemma, especially from a psychoanalytic standpoint, to insist on a forced choice between either an entirely pre-capitalist or an entirely capitalist superego, wholly of the past or wholly of the present. What is more, the same later Freud who criticizes Marxism along the lines presently under consideration, 
also portrays the type of cultural superego typical of his late 19th and early 20th century European cultural milieu as essentially Kantian. That is to say, the superego of concern in, for instance, civilization and its discontents closely resembles the will and conscience of Kant's deontological ethics of pure practical reason with its categorical imperative and you can because you must unconditionality. The new introductory lectures on psychoanalysis continue to associate the superego severity with Kantian ethical rigorism. And in 1923's The Ego and the Id, Freud is especially explicit about the connection between Kant's conscience and his superego. Quote, the superego, the conscience at work in the ego, may become harsh, cruel, and inexorable against the ego which is in its charge. Kant's categorical imperative is thus the direct heir of the Oedipus complex, end quote. And the Kantian metaphysics of morals is itself a barely disguised pseudo-secularization of a Protestant ethical worldview, at least in Freud's eyes. Protestantism is born at roughly the same time as European capitalism. Additionally, as both Marx and after him Weber stress, Protestant Christianity plays a key role in the rise and persistence of industrial capitalism. And of course, Kant and his work are situated in the German-speaking world of the late 18th, of late 18th century Europe. So if the Freudian cultural superego is modeled on the subject of Kantian ethics, then once again, just how independent is this superego of its surrounding economic conditions? In addition to Freud's just criticized qualification of historical materialism involving the theory of the superego, his 1933 pronouncements on the topic of Marxism also put forward a second caveat tempering his concessions to the partial validity of this economically centered political perspective. In the context of lecturing on the topic of Weltanschauungen, Freud claims that Marxism, in its atheistic fight against religious worldviews, has itself become another religious worldview. Freud states, please see quotation number two on the handout. Quote, the newly achieved discovery of the far-reaching importance of economic relations brought with it a temptation not to leave alterations in them to the course of historical development, but to put them into effect oneself by revolutionary action. Theoretical Marxism, as realized in Russian Bolshevism, has acquired the energy and the self-contained and exclusive character of a Weltanschauung but at the same time an uncanny likeness to what it is fighting against. Though originally a portion of science and built up in its implementation upon science and technology, it has created a prohibition of thought which is just as ruthless as was that of religion in the past. Any critical examination of Marxist theory is forbidden Doubts of its correctness are punished in the same way as heresy was once punished by the Catholic Church. The writings of Marx have taken the place of the Bible and the Quran as a source of revelation, though they would seem to be no more free from contradictions and obscurities than those older sacred books." End quote. At the start of these remarks, Freud again grants a great deal of validity to historical materialism with its emphasis on the role of economic dimensions in history. The second sentence of this passage then opens with what appears to be an implicit distinction between the intellectual framework of historical materialism, that is, theoretical Marxism, and its concrete sociopolitical implementation, that is, revolutionary action as realized in Russian Bolshevism. Clearly, the central thrust of the preceding quotation from the new introductory lectures on psychoanalysis is the unfavorable comparison of Bolshevism with Catholicism and or Islam. This comparison should come as no surprise in a lecture entitled The Question of a Weltanschauung. As is well known, Freud is at pains in this particular lecture 
to deny that psychoanalysis itself constitutes its own worldview. He famously insists that analysis merely borrows or participates in the Weltanschauung of modernity's empirical experimental sciences of nature. This appeal to the scientific worldview brings with it the familiar contrast between science and religion, reason and faith. Given Freud's fashion of contrasting science and religion, coupled with his attribution of a worldview to modern science itself, he has to admit that something can be a worldview without, for all that, therefore being a religion too. Freud indeed appears to distinguish between Marxism as a scientific Weltanschauung and Bolshevism as a religion departing from this worldview. Yet, interesting questions remain. How would Freud relate the concept terms Weltanschauung and ideology? Are all worldviews also ideologies? Or are some worldviews, such as perhaps scientific ones, not ideological? Furthermore, and apropos the Marxist tradition, if Freud grants that historical materialism is or participates in a scientific Weltanschauung without being a religion, can the translation of this theory into practice through revolutionary sociopolitical action be accomplished in a non-religious way? Or, for Freud, is the alleged morphing of the science of Marxism into the religion of Bolshevism made inevitable by the very nature of the general process of turning ideas into politics? Alas, much of what these questions ask about remains hazy or even unaddressed in Freud's writings. In Freud's eyes, the inevitable commingling of science and ideology in the translation of theory into practice might very well be tantamount to the degeneration of the scientific into the religious. Yet, is this commingling not requisite for a scientific theory to enjoy actual transformative efficacy at the practical level of real-world politics. Are not phenomena commonly associated with religiosity, including belief, devotion, faith, fervor, and passion, crucial ingredients of any effective political movement? He or she who wishes to avoid dirtying his or her hands with ideologies and anything resembling religious phenomena also wishes to avoid all revolutionary activity. Freud himself comes to concede that what he disapproves of as the religious aspects of Bolshevism may turn out to be indispensable to its quest to usher in a quote-unquote new social order. There are two more sets of lengthy remarks Freud makes about communism in his 1933 lecture on the question of a Weltanschauung I have yet to address. Both of these portions of this lecture evince a pronounced, explicit ambivalence on Freud's part, apropos Marxism and its political implementation in the guise of Bolshevism. Indeed, these two passages from the new introductory lectures on psychoanalysis provide openings for an imminent critical reworking of Freud's political reflections, a reworking informed by a synthesis of Marxism and psychoanalysis, and this reworking will be what I come to at the close of, of my talk. But there's still a bit of work to do before we are in a position to uh, appreciate this. Freud dismisses the claims of classical historical materialism to predictive power. However, he values this same historical materialism for its insights into the previously un- or underappreciated importance of, econo of economies for human social existence. In this vein, Freud comments, please see quotation number three on the handout. Quote, the strength of Marxism clearly lies not in its view of history or the prophecies of the future that are based on it, but in its sagacious indication of the decisive influence which the economic circumstances of men have upon their intellectual, ethical, and artistic attitudes. A number of connections and implications were thus uncovered, which had previously been almost totally overlooked. 
But it cannot be assumed that economic motives are the only ones that determine the behavior of human beings in society. The undoubted fact that different individuals, races, and nations behave differently under the same economic conditions is alone enough to show that economic motives are not the sole dominating factors. It is altogether incomprehensible how psychological factors can be overlooked where what is in question are the reactions of living human beings. For not only were these reactions concerned in establishing the economic conditions, but even under the domination of those conditions, men can only bring their original instinctual impulses into play, their self-preservative instinct, their aggressiveness, their need to be loved, their drive towards obtaining pleasure and avoiding unpleasure. In an earlier inquiry, I also pointed out the important claims made by the superego, which represents tradition and the ideals of the past and will for a time resist the incentives of a new economic situation. And finally, we must not forget that the mass of human beings who are subjected to economic necessities also undergo the process of cultural development, of civilization, as other people may say, which, though no doubt influenced by all the other factors, is certainly independent of them in its origin, being comparable to an organic process and very well able on its part to exercise an influence on the other factors. It displaced instinctual aims and brings it about that people become antagonistic to what they had previously tolerated. Moreover, the progressive strengthening of the scientific spirit seems to form an essential part of it. If anyone were in a position to show in detail the way in which these different factors, the general inherited human disposition, its racial variations, and its cultural transformations, inhibit and promote one another under the conditions of social rank, profession, and earning capacity, if anyone were able to do this, he would have supplemented Marxism so that it was made into a genuine social science. For sociology too, dealing as it does with the behavior of people in society, cannot be anything but applied psychology. Strictly speaking, there are only two sciences, psychology, pure and applied, and natural science." End quote. A remark by Gramsci is a fitting response to Freud's concerns, one Freud shares with the likes of Weber. Quote, frequently people attack historical economism in the belief that they are attacking historical materialism, end quote. Economistic vulgarizations of historical materialism perpetrated by both the Second International and Stalinism indeed are vulnerable to the sorts of reservations and objections raised by Freud in this passage. However, Marx and Engels, especially given their concessions apropos the role of human-mindedness in socio-historical processes, are far from guilty of the neglect of quote-unquote psychology prompting Freud's criticisms here. In the quotation above, Freud also refers back to his employment of the theory of the superego against historical materialism's prioritization of the economy. Having already responded to this, I will not repeat myself now. Furthermore, the just quoted passage from the question of a Weltanschauung also involves Freud repeating his now familiar recourse to the notion of an immutable human nature as an obstacle to the perhaps unrealistic aspirations of socialist and communist socio-political programs. He speaks of humanity's quote-unquote original instinctual impulses, ursprünglichen Triebergungen, as constituting this purportedly incorrigible nature. Yet the very list Freud then furnishes of these Triebe provides openings for Marxist lines of response to his charging of Marxism with a hopeless, doomed utopianism. Freud identifies the following as instances of the original instinctual impulses he has in mind when warning Marxists about the impossibility of radically transforming human nature. Quote, their self-preservative instinct, Selbsterhaltungstrieb, 
their aggressiveness, their need to be loved, Liebesbedürfnis, their drive, drang, towards obtaining pleasure and avoiding unpleasure, end quote. As seen both in Civilization and its Discontents and elsewhere in the new introductory lectures on psychoanalysis, Freud focuses exclusively on aggression as the purportedly natural drive threatening to derail Marxist revolutions. On these other occasions of making the human nature objection to Marxism, Freud does not mention self-love, I mean, sorry, self-preservation, interesting slip, self-preservation, love, and the pleasure principle. <laughs> Apart from the issue of aggression, which I will address momentarily, the other original instinctual impulses Freud mentions in the preceding quotation from the question of a Weltanschauung, one, pose no obstacles to socialism or communism, two, readily could be pressed into the willing service of such new social orders, and or three, potentially could be encouraged to rebel against really existing capitalism. Apropos the self-preservative instinct, is not today's global capitalism, with its staggering wealth inequality, vulnerable to and deserving of being judged an abject failure by the majority of the world's population? Does this capitalism not fail to satisfy even the most basic self-preservative needs of the billions of people it abandons to squalid poverty? As regards Freud's postulated need to be loved, there seems to be no reason whatsoever to presume that this drive level natural impulse can be satisfied only through non-socialist and non-communist social arrangements and or that such a need cannot be satisfied through socialist and communist social arrangements. One must recall that this same later Freud ties love to a sweeping vision of Eros inspired by the ancient Greeks. Starting in 1920s Beyond the Pleasure Principle, Eros's life drives, enjoining the individual organism and its psyche to forge links and unite with others, are portrayed by Freud as pushing back against the Todes Trib's inclinations toward hostility, severance, and withdrawal. This push and pull between the centrifugal and constructive life drives and the centripetal and destructive death drive is very different from the uncontested dominance and one-way thrust of virulent, undiluted aggression. Indeed, elsewhere, including in civilization and its discontents when not objecting to Marxism, Freud describes the struggle between Eros and the Todes Trib as open-ended and of uncertain outcome. In the ego and the id, when entertaining the possibility that the id is, quote, under the domination of the mute but powerful death instincts, end quote, he admits, quote, perhaps that might be to undervalue the part played by Eros, end quote. And the concluding paragraph of the sixth chapter of Civilization and its Discontents draws to a close after emphasizing the threat posed by innate human aggression to organize sociality itself, it draws to a close with a sweeping vision of the war between Eros and the Todes Trib writ large across the entire arc of human history. The triumph of love over death is not guaranteed in advance, but neither is the triumph of aggression, Todes Trib, over sociality, Eros an uncertainty forcefully reiterated in the very final paragraph of civilization and its discontents. Although Freud is no optimist, neither is he a fatalist. Even in the face of the rise of anti-Semitic fascism and species-threatening techno-scientific warfare, Freud insists on the uncertainty as to whether or not the death drive forces of hatred and annihilation will triumph. This uncertainty is thanks to Eros, namely what the new introductory lectures on psychoanalysis identify as both the self-preservative instinct and the need to be loved that are for Freud himself just as intrinsic to human nature as aggressiveness. As I highlighted earlier, Freud tends to play the Hobbesian when pitting himself against Marxism. <clears throat> 
At such moments, he risks implying, among other things, that the totus trib as aggression is the exclusive or overriding tendency at the base of human nature and psychical life. But Freud's flirtations with Hobbes court the peril of him falling prey to a profound self-misunderstanding. Freud's human is not wholly Hobbes' wolf. Instead, he or she is a reluctant, conflicted political animal, profoundly ambivalent about his or her inescapable social entanglements with others, but a political animal, zuon politikon, nonetheless. Already in 1895's Project for a Scientific Psychology, Freud posits that, quote, the initial helplessness of human beings is the primal source of all moral motives, end quote. Much later, in 1926's Inhibition, Symptoms, and Anxiety, Freud revisits this posit and writes, please see quotation number four on the handout. Quote, the biological factor is the long period of time during which the young of the human species is in a condition of helplessness and dependence. Its intrauterine existence seems to be short in comparison with that of most animals, and it is sent into the world in a less finished state. As a result, the influence of the real external world upon it is intensified, and an early differentiation between the ego and the id is promoted. Moreover, the dangers of the external world have a greater importance for it so that the value of the object which can alone protect it against them and take the place of its former intrauterine life is enormously enhanced. The biological factor then establishes the earliest situations of danger and creates the need to be loved, which will accompany the child through the rest of its life." End quote. Freud is neither vague nor ambiguous in asserting that humans' lengthy period of helplessness, itself a biologically innate feature of their organic being, renders them social by nature. Starting with the early total and complete dependence on the Nebenmensch's helper, usually a caretaking parent or parents, the young subject-to-be is destined by biology itself to be entangled with and formed by relations with others. Furthermore, Hilflosigkeit entails a plasticity of human nature. As Freud indicates, for the psyche rooted in an initially helpless body, quote, the influence of the real external world upon it is intensified and an early differentiation between the ego and the id is promoted, end quote. Of course, the most important features of the real external world are social ones in this case, namely emotionally important others as exerting the decisive influences modulating the nascent subject's id and helping to sculpt its emerging ego. The Freudian psyche with its plasticity is naturally pre-programmed by helplessness to be socially reprogrammed. So, not only is Arrow substantially empowered by the naturally given and ontogenetically primary couple Hilflosigkeit Liebesbedürfnis, this couple also brings with it a psychical plasticity amounting to the susceptibility of the libidinal economy to being tamed and domesticated by its social milieu. Others in positions of a social reality principle significantly shape the routes and directions of drives and their derivatives. More specifically, these impositions mold the contours of sublimations. Indeed, social valuations as determining the substitutive object choices of libidinal thrusts confronted with social prohibitions are inherent to the very definition of sublimation as a fundamental concept in Freudian psychoanalysis. Hence, the combination of prematurational helplessness and the need for love to which it gives rise renders the psychical subject to be inclined towards socially specified sublimations. 
Such sublimations in relation to Freud's 1920 onwards dual drive model would not be limited exclusively to the side of Eros, quite the contrary. Considering the later Freud's depiction of aggression as much more existentially threatening to societies and sexuality, developing children inevitably are confronted with social regulations demanding sublimations of their aggression. Furthermore, according to Freud's own theory, aggression already is a secondary modification of the totus trieb. The latter originally is an intrapsychically directed self-destructiveness. Extra-psychically directed destructiveness, aggression toward objects and others in external reality, already is a life-affirming deflection or displacement of this originally life-annulling suicidal tendency. Freud indeed treats exogenous aggression as a secondary modification of the death drive's primary endogenous self-destructiveness, with Eros playing a role in bringing about this modification. Freud's speculative posit, according to which the death drive's exogenous destructiveness already is a secondary detour for its primary endogenous self-destructiveness, raises an interesting question in connection with his reservations regarding Marxism's prospects. As seen, Freud frets that the totus trieb as aggression will be resistant to and disruptive of any socialist or communist sociopolitical project. Yet, if this aggression is itself a dilution and redirection of a more primordial undercurrent of endogenous self-destructiveness, then could not a Marxist program extolling and enjoining self-sacrifice for the sake of the revolutionary cause appeal to and tap into the foundational archaic thrust of the death drive prior to its channeling into outwardly directed hostility? Would not the sacrificial self-renunciations demanded by the radical reinvention of society facilitate, perhaps once again with some assistance from Eros, a sort of socialist or communist desublimation tapping back into the original inc incarnation of the totus trieb. The very last set of Freud's observations about Marxism from 1933's lecture, The Question of a Weltanschauung, again speak about the uncertain outcomes a venir of the then new socialist experiment in Russia. Freud engages in the following imaginary exchange with the Bolsheviks he has been criticizing intermittently in the new introductory lectures on psychoanalysis. And here, please see quotation number five on the handout. Quote, there is no doubt of how Bolshevism will reply to these objections. It will say that so long as men's nature has not yet been transformed, it is necessary to make use of the means which affect them today. It is impossible to do without compulsions in their education, without the prohibition of thought, and without the employment of force to the point of bloodshed. And if the illusions were not awakened in them, they could not be brought to acquiesce in this compulsion. And we should be politely asked to say how things could be managed differently. This would defeat us. I could think of no advice to give. I should admit that the conditions of this experiment would have deterred me and those like me from undertaking it. But we are not the only people concerned. There are men of action, unshakable in their convictions, inaccessible to doubt, without feelings for the suffering of others if they stand in the way of their intentions. We have to thank men of this kind for the fact that the tremendous experiment of producing a new order of this kind is now actually being carried out in Russia. At a time when the great nations announce that they expect salvation only from the maintenance of Christian piety, the revolution in Russia, in spite of all its disagreeable details, seems nonetheless like the message of a better future. Unluckily, neither our skepticism nor the fanatical faith of the other side gives a hint as to how the experiment will turn out. The future will tell us. Perhaps it will show that the experiment was undertaken prematurely, 
that a sweeping alteration of the social order has little prospect of success until new discoveries have increased our control over the forces of nature and so made easier the satisfaction of our needs. Only then, perhaps, may it become possible for a new social order not only to put an end to the material need of the masses, but also to give a hearing to the cultural demands of the individual. Even then, to be sure, we shall still have to struggle for an incalculable time with the difficulties which the untamable character, unbendigkeit, of human nature presents to every kind of social community." End quote. Freud, in his extreme intellectual honesty, reaches this point of admitting that his skepticism apropos Bolshevism by no means amounts to any knockdown arguments against it in the Marxist tradition of which it is a part. He grants that the October Revolution, quote, seems like the message of a better future, end quote, at least by comparison with bourgeois false promises of, quote, salvation only from the maintenance of Christian piety, end quote. As for the eventual outcome of the socialist experiment, quote, the future will tell us, end quote. Freud obviously has in mind the figures, as he views them, of Lenin and Trotsky as epitomizing the sorts of Bolshevik he employs above as an imagined foil for his own doubts about socialism and communism. Freud, in the face of what he anticipates by way of the Bolshevik self-justification in response to his reservations, even concedes that, quote, this would defeat us, I could think of no advice to give, end quote. But, despite Freud's oscillations and inconsistencies in his reactions to Marxism, the final sentence of the prior block quotation amounts to him reiterating his oft-repeated claim that human nature, as per psychoanalysis, poses a perhaps insurmountable barrier to Marxism's revolutionary political-economic agenda. James Strachey chooses to render Unbendigkeit as quote-unquote untamable character, likely because of this German word occurring in an argumentative context in which Freud is suggesting that human nature will resist efforts to significantly reform or transform it. However, the adjective Unbendig could be translated into English as boisterous and or unrestrained. The various elements of human nature Freud has in mind when criticizing Marxism are not, according to Freud's own psychoanalytic reasoning, untamable in the strong sense, namely utterly impervious to domesticating social influences, bringing about sublimations and the like. That is to say, this nature might be boisterous, but still not untamable. Analysis indeed provides ample evidence for this boisterousness, and additionally, it also provides ample evidence that this boisterousness can be, and usually is, tamed by external realities, including social ones. In fact, aggression and the todestrieb underlying it are not, by Freud's own lights, untamable. To reiterate, Aggression itself already is, for Freud, an eros-assisted taming of the originally self-destructive death drive. Furthermore, I would observe that aggression can be, and indeed is, sublimated in myriad manners. As Freud himself indicates in 1933's Why War, all that is needed is to find outlets other than collective armed conflict between militaries, and that is enough. From a Marxist perspective, I would go even further and assert that capitalist societies foster sublimations of aggression in fashions that help make possible socialist and communist social accommodations of the aggression Freud fears post-capitalist social systems could not accommodate. What I am about to propose as I move towards a conclusion is an addition inspired by a Marxist appreciation of psychoanalysis to Marxism's inventory of those features of capitalism serving as historical conditions of possibility for the sublation of capitalism via socialism and communism. As with other capitalist phenomena, 
This is an instance of something that, although superficially appearing to be distant from and or antagonistic to socialism and communism, actually has the potential to be conducive to such post-capitalist arrangements. As is common knowledge, competition is central to capitalism. The early stages of capitalist industrialization involved economic sectors in which multiple isolated small producers, for instance, individual factories and their owners, jostled with each other for advantage in given markets. Although such small producer competition long ago ceased to be a dominant essential feature of capitalist economies, a mythic celebration of such competition continues to live on in capitalist ideologies right up through the present day. What is more, forms of competition, historical materialism would identify as originating at the infrastructural level of capitalist societies have spread like wildfire across the expanses and throughout all the nooks and crannies of the superstructural levels of these same societies. So many of the cultural and political diversions and concerns within capitalism clearly are superstructural sublimations of infrastructural competition, with agonistic competition itself arguably being a sublimation of even more antagonistic and violent aggression. Under capitalism, institutions and spectacles having to do with everything from government and education to sports and games come to be organized as zero-sum winners versus losers competitions, or at least as semblances thereof. Even the sex and love lives of capitalism subjects are not untouched by subliminatory permutations of cutthroat economic competition. Indeed, as the Communist Manifesto already proclaimed in 1848, nothing whatsoever is sacred to capital. Although historical materialism would propose that superstructural forms of competitiveness originate in capitalism's earlier modes of infrastructural competition, I would venture to posit that over the subsequent course of capitalist economic history, economic competition has itself been transformed, at least in significant part, into a type of not immediately economic competition. Put differently, capitalist competitiveness about the accumulation of surplus value, itself a sublimation of aggression as per psychoanalysis, has come to be sublimated in turn by the superstructural sublimations of this infrastructural competitiveness that initially inspires these superstructural sublimations. In still other words, the riches at stake in the race between capitalists to amass surplus value, primarily in the guise of money, come to be more than economic signifiers of social status, cultural prestige, political power, and the like. In a reversal resonating with a psychoanalytic sensibility encapsulated in Wordsworth's The Child is the Father of the Man, the infrastructural parent, that is economic competition, has become the child of its superstructural children, that is more than economic competition. Perhaps this dynamic of an earlier sublimation being recast in the guise of the later sublimations to which it gives rise should be baptized retroactive as Nachtreglichkeit resublimation. Taking the preceding points apropos competition into account, Freud's worries about aggression specifically as an insuperable difficulty for socialism and communism can be largely, if not completely, laid to rest. In particular, Two related lines of counter-argumentation vis-a-vis Freud on Marxism versus aggressiveness now are available at this juncture. First, capitalism in fostering the proliferation of superstructural socio-symbolic sublimations of infrastructural competitiveness provides potential future socialist and communist societies with ample outlets for the aggressive tendencies of these societies' members. Even with the abolition of private property qua capital, and along with it, the wealth disparities of class stratified social configurations, capitalism leaves behind and bequeaths to its historical successors 
plenty of more than economic opportunities for competitively marking differences between persons. However desirable or not, the sublimated aggression of jockeying for socio-symbolic inequality of recognition and superiority likely will remain after the disappearance of directly material economic inequality. Just as socialist and communist societies can and do take over the science, technology, and infrastructural machinery of the capitalist mode of production, with such appropriation being crucial for the viability and success of these post-capitalist orders, so too can such societies also take over the non-economic sublimations of aggression developed by capitalism at its superstructural levels. If, as per Freud, aggression must be satisfied, if only in sublimated manners, then more than economic competitiveness ought to do the job effectively enough. I come now to the second line of counter-argumentation with respect to Freud on Marxism versus aggressiveness. A moment ago, I described a capitalism imminent process of economic competitiveness, itself a sublimation of aggression, becoming just one among the more than economic permutations of competitiveness, especially past a certain threshold in the stacking up of massive amounts of surplus value, wealth as quotas of quantifiable exchange value is, for such incredibly affluent capitalists, more about, for example, outranking each other on lists of the most wealthy individuals, garnering greater amounts of media attention, commanding outsized sway over politics, or outdoing one another in socially praised public philanthropy. For such persons as bearers or personifications of capital, money is no longer really about money if it ever was in the first place. Hence, the sublimated aggression deep-pocketed capitalists gratify through economic competition as a competition already about for these subjects things different from quantitative wealth alone, is ready-made to be socially retranslated into expressions in terms other than purely monetary ones. Such capitalist masses of surplus and exchange values are so far in excess of what could be personally consumed by them and their entourages in tangible qualitative use values as to reveal that this amassing is not motivated by the desire to consume material riches. The latter subjective motive should be seen here in contrast with the animating logic of capital, MCM prime, money, commodities, more money, as the self-enhancing, ever-growing spiral of intangible quantitative exchange values via capital's appropriation of labor-produced surplus values. Capitalists appear at the intersection of Marxism and psychoanalysis in two distinct but not unrelated lights. From the Marxist angle, they are primarily, in their role as capitals, personifications, or bearers, de-psychologized agents of the structural dynamic of MCM prime. As such, they are concerned, however consciously or not, exclusively with the in-principle infinite accumulation of quantitative surplus and exchange values. But from the psychoanalytic angle, they also are more than just such mere personifications or bearers. As Freud himself would emphasize, capital's agents additionally are, among other things, psychical subjects of enjoyments having to do with socio-symbolic secondary gains exuded from the pure accumulation of capital. Insofar as these secondary gains, as superstructural byproducts of capitalism's infrastructural logic, Insofar as these secondary gains can be generated by strictly superstructural socio-symbolic pursuits, they can be had without the economic category of capitalist private property, that is, individually owned means of production. Again, the psyches of capital's personifications or bearers should be able to satisfy their aggression-tinged libidinal investments in inter- and trans-subjectively recognized prestige, renown, status, etc., through subliminatory means other than the strictly economic competition associated with the capitalist mode of production. Realizing this goes a long way towards a Marxism that has passed through rather than simply bypassed 
Freud's psychoanalytic reservations about its feasibility. Thank you. Thanks, Adrian, um, for a really great talk. Uh, now the floor is yours, uh, the audience, uh, for Q&As. So who is going to start first? Maybe I can take this as a sign I'm so thoroughly convinced <laughs> <laughs> the audience that there is simply no dispute to be had. <laughs> no. a, a minute of silence. It's a kind of ritual. Yes, here. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions, comments? Otherwise, I mean, it's more a curiosity because it's uh, something that. Uh, just implicitly relates to, to your talk. Um, recall the Benjaminian distinction uh, and different relation to uh, history and the past yes. uh, and tradition from the thesis on the philosophy of history. Yes. Where he says basically historicity and historicists very much appreciate tradition while historical materialist has a kind of unique singular relation to history, which is kind of opposed yes. to the way historicists appreciate tradition. Do you see any connection to how Freud in all those quotes, but even beyond all those quotes, uh, conceives superego as a bearer of tradition uh, Yes, this is this, and I had this hadn't occurred to me. Um, and before I get to directly answering the thrust of your question, um, I should lay out just a few prefatory remarks about the approach of this particular text that I exerted from the larger project. Um, that it's not as though I myself fully agree with both. Freud's version of Marxism here, I mean, that's obvious, but um, what I am doing is performing a, a very strictly imminent critique here. And so I, in a way, am deliberately naive, and I initially concede, all right, um, there are these very standard pre-Benjaminian, among other figures, ways of conceiving of classical 19th century Marxism, however accurate or inaccurate, um, and that furthermore we have you know, Freud's own theoretical framework that he is drawing elements from, including his theory of the superego, in critiquing what he takes traditional historical materialism to be. Um, and in this talk specifically, it's a matter of undoing some of Freud's own criticisms of Freud's conception or misconception of traditional Marxism, relying only on the resources that Freud himself deploys before questions of, for example, say, you know, Lacanian caveats or qualifications to, you know, certain versions of this Freud, et cetera. Um, and so it's seeing if one can argue against Freud's critique of Marxism on his own grounds, including his idea, however faithful or distorting, of what Marx and company in the 19th century are actually committed to. So that's the big caveat or qualification that I should put up front. Um, and incidentally, if you're interested in more in Lacan than Freud, well, on Monday, I will be focusing on, on, on Lacan vis-a-vis -vis Pascal, and, and that's a separate thing. Um, but here, um, with I think that it hadn't occurred to me, but I think you are right, that the way Freud talks about the inherent conservatism of the superego and ties it to 
um, a certain inertia of tradition. Um, you know, I'm even thinking of Marx's description of things like, you know, the, the, the past weighs upon the brains of the living like a nightmare, et cetera. Um, that, you know, indeed, you know, Freud is bringing out something that I think Benjamin, you know, following Marx would say, yes, that there is this, um, it's not just that there's this, uh, you know, theoretical approach um, that is opposed to the sensibilities of historical materialism and its understanding of social history. That it's also really the case in terms of, you know, actual members of society, their spontaneous self you know, conception or self-misconceptions, you know, their ways of relating to their own history, which involves this historicism or traditionalism um, that historical materialism has to combat not only in theory, but in practice. Um, and that, uh, you know, as I point out when dealing with Freud's theory of the superego, um, and there was some material in this vein that I skipped over in the interest of time, but in the very context in which he mobilizes his theory of the superego and a critique of Marxism, he also concedes that, well, you know, essentially, the different subcomponents of the psyche, as per his second topography of, uh, you know, particularly, uh, you know, the different aspects of ego and superego are very much like what he describes as that holographic image of the city of Rome in which you could see preserved side by side, you know, all of the different sedimentary layers of the city's history um, virtually superimposed on each other, that very powerful image that he uses. Um, and he's well aware that that is, you know, the most accurate way in terms of faithfulness to his own larger metapsychological framework of talking about the psyche in general, but also about, you know, specific subsectors of it, such as the superego. If that is the case, right, then the, what I think is a cruder way he has of characterizing the superego when it suits his purposes to argue against what he takes to be Marx's position is really unfaithful to his more nuanced appreciation. Yeah. Right. So... Um, thank you, Adrian. It was really, really beautiful. Um, and yeah, I have a question. Um, if I got you right, um, I, I really um, like this idea of this resublimation, -sub of this sort of a rebounds of the superstructure to the infrastructure, yes. back to it. And which means that in a sense, um, it's a very long process of like changing the society. And I have a question here. So um, what would you say um, about the possibility of a revolution or of a rupture of this process? So is it in this sense a revolution always um, a failure because it maybe it's tries to change the the infrastructure but fails uh, like changing yeah. also the superstructure. Yeah. So this would be one thing, uh, one question, and the second would be: um, Do you think this some this process somehow changes also with digitalization, or what would be? I mean, is there another structure? Like, like, would be like digital, like virtual world, another super, super structure, or it's just a, another functioning of the, or different functioning of the superstructure, and how this affects this resublimation process. Yes. Well, thank you, Bara. Um, so I should say uh, preliminarily, apropos the the prospects of revolution, I will admit I'm quite pessimistic. You know, I think in terms of the old, uh, um, you know, Engels and Luxembourg alternative socialism or barbarism, it seems that we're on the train towards the barbarism stop and not, you know, not the, the viable post-capitalist one. But, um, you know, and it's fortuitous that uh, a moment ago Bastian mentioned uh, Benjamin. Um, what I love about that piece in particular, 1940s theses on the philosophy of history, is 
the incredibly delicate, not just conceptual, but you might even say affective balancing act that, that Benny Mean is involved in, even though shortly after um, he takes his own life to evade the clutches of the Gestapo. Um, and it's, it's really, to me, an, a, an just almost an admirable sort of characterological feature of Benjamin at that moment. Um, when I teach this text uh, uh, with, with my students, you know, I, I try to begin by making them appreciate, all right, imagine that you are a German-speaking, radical leftist, Marxist intellectual on the European continent in the 1930s. I mean, not only are you, you know, surrounded by the rise of virulently anti-Semitic fascism, but the one beacon of hope, uh, you know, uh, to the east has already descended into Stalinist terror, and the revolution has, you know, as per the famous, uh, uh, or, you know, revolution betrayed. That the Thermidor has happened there, um, and if you're Benjamin, you have every reason in the world to succumb to utter and complete despondent fatalism, right? It's, it, this, it, it could not have turned out worse, right? Um, and of course, just a few years later, some of his fellow travelers, I mean, if we flash forward to 1947 with uh, Horkheimer and Adorno's The Dialectic of Enlightenment, you essentially do have a, a, a fatalistic turn. It is, you know, a thorough pessimism. Marxism, isn't going to result in any kind of social progress, but it can, it can give us a precise uh, means of cognitively mapping just how fucked we are. And that's that, right? That, I mean, maybe that's an oversimplification, but I do think there is that fatalistic outlook that is, very, especially with Adorno, is quite powerful. Um, but a few years prior, you have Benjamin say, on the one hand, the traditional complacent optimism, the confidence of everyone involved in, for instance, German social democracy, um, you know, the Second International, and of course also Stalin's version of this too, that is obviously bullshit. Um, that, you know, if we look at what, you know, in the first decades of the 20th century is already happening, um, you know, clearly, you know, we do not have good reason for being optimistic. But at the same time, right, one of the key things about Benjamin's essay from 1940 is saying, nonetheless, we are never licensed to become completely pessimistic in terms of a necessitarian fatalism, right? That, you know, the Messiah might walk through the, you know, straight gates of history one fine day un unexpectedly right? It could happen. Um, and I think it's a very admirable balancing act. And of course, part of it is that he, um, you know, and I, I read his recourse to Paul Clay's The Angel of History and, is, and using that image as, in a way, a kind of implicit remobilization of Hegel's Owl of Minerva in a different guise, right? It's that it's backwards looking. We can see the past leading up to the present, but the winds blowing us into the future, our back is turned to that, you know. Um, and in renouncing a certain traditional historical materialism's claims to predictive power, which Freud also takes issue with, with Benjamin, um, we have to then, as a matter of theoretical principle, accept we can neither be overconfident optimists that the invisible hand of history will deposit us on a post -cap the shores of a post-capitalist paradise, guaranteed, and where the Revolutionary Party is basically militating for the sun to rise. Um, but, you know, uh, 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 we're not licensed to indulge in that, but we're also not licensed to think it, we're doomed, utterly and completely. So I'm sorry, that took a little longer to lay out. Um, now, um, you know, in terms of questions about revolution, though, in a way, I'm, I, I feel I can afford, in the context of this talk, to be noncommittal about that. It's more a matter of just defanging some of the standard objections that Freud himself channels as to why things wouldn't work out. And uh, again, teaching this not only to graduate students, I sometimes also teach a, a sort of uh, history of Marxism for, for our undergraduate students at UNM. It's great to test the waters with, you know, 18 to 22 year olds who are, you know, f you know, fresh products of the current educational ideological state apparatus, you know, and to see where, uh, you know, where their thinking is at about these matters. And routinely, 
one of the commonest objections that they come up with is the selfishness one. And to say human beings are, you know, and, you know, in an, with, you know, selfishness for them, I think, involving the kind of aggression Freud has in mind. Human beings are inherently, incorrigibly, inevitably, always have been, always will be, uh, uh, you know, aggressively selfish. Um, and what I want to say is, really, the selfishness debate is, and this is one of the bigger claims of the whole book that this is drawn from, and in fact, the preface opens with this, the whole selfishness debate, in my view, is a total red herring, right? Um, it, the, the real issue is, right, is let's just for the sake of argument grant that there's something transhistorical about quote-unquote selfishness, right? The idea that you can, that simply acknowledging that means that capitalism is the most natural and an unsurpassable socio-historical arrangement is a total non sequitur. It doesn't even get off the ground as an argument. You know, because part of my point is, we don't need some sort of Pollyannish view of, oh, we can turn human beings into these entirely good-natured kumbaya, holding hands, rainbows, unicorns, and, you know, uh, you know group love, uh, you know, sort of beings. No, we can take us in all of our ugliness, you know, including the very nasty sides of ourselves that Freud was so good at bringing out and making us reckon with. Um, without that concession, requiring us to say that dooms, for instance, a what is ultimately a rather modest change, things such as, well, no, privatized, you know, industrial means of production, et cetera, and the commodified labor power that goes along with it, we can alter that, right? And we can alter it, and yes, human beings are still going to be selfish, et cetera, but the notion that the only way to satisfy selfishness is through enrichment in the guise of using others' labor power to generate what you then arrogate to yourself as quantified surplus value. Um, that money, for instance, even more simply put, that only money will scratch that itch. I just, I, I, it's amazing to me that this argument ha has, continues to have such popularity and traction. Um, and so, you know, I'm looking to, and this is where there's I'm much more sympathetic to Freud than this talk might uh, lead you to believe. I think that much of what he says about how, you know, that, that there are these very unpalatable sides of ourselves from a certain perspective, yes, they're there, but they can be, they can be dealt with. They can be redirected. They're surprisingly malleable and adaptive, and psychoanalysis is also good at showing that, right? So that's one thing on the, the, the uh, you know, the, the issue of prospects for revolution. It's just to say the standard arguments for defeating it I don't think really work. As for you know, future changes in superstructure, here I might be tempted to use Benjamin once again as a cheap get out of jail card, right? Um, well, my back too is like the angel of history. I'm just being propelled into the future. How, you know, but yeah, part of what I wanted to show with the idea of what I called retroactive resublimation is that it's always struck me that it really seems clear that the biggest of the big bourgeoisie, like today, you know, figures today such as, you know, Zuckerberg, um, Musk, et cetera, um, given they're faced with a problem that in Hollywood in 1985 was very nicely captured in a Richard Pryor comedy, uh, Brewster's Millions. I don't know if any of you have seen it, but it involved a uh, 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 the character being challenged to spend on him or herself in terms of private use value consumption you know, a gargantuan sum of money. And it's remarkably hard, right? And for, if you're someone like Elon Musk, I mean, you would be hard pressed actually to, you know, in a single lifetime, get anywhere close to burning through your pile of cash, to put it very simplistically. And that indicates that for these people, it just doesn't have much to do with ordinary, you know, non-bourgeois, you know, you know, schmucks like myself, you know, wage or salary laborers, uh, you know, whether working for the state educational institution or some other employer, that there's literally, as Marx points out through his contrasting logics of MCM prime versus CMC prime, you know, the latter being the, you know, the, the pattern for the laborer or, you know, all those who are not themselves capitalists, it indicates that this is not really about what we ordinarily understand consumption-oriented selfishness to be about. Um, and given that, that indicates that whatever 
libidinal itches, this massive accumulation of scratching for the likes of Musk, Zuckerberg, etc. It's not really all that dependent on money, um, and therefore there's no reason to think it would not find a, a, a satisfying way to manifest itself after economic relations have been altered in a Again, not really all that crazy way, a relatively modest fashion through redistributive measures, if that helps. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next. Oh, record. Um, thank you for this very detailed reading of uh, of Freud's uh, criticism. Um, I enjoyed it quite a lot. I've been Thanks. thinking about this um, sentence um, from passage you, uh, you gave us, uh, number three. Strictly speaking, there are only two sciences, psychology, yeah. pure and applied, yeah. and the natural science. Um, it's kind of interesting. I think it explains why um, Freud would even want to challenge to, to, to see Marxism as a kind of challenge. So he wants to, to have his psychology or psychoanalysis to be the science of the, the social as well. Yeah. So he wants to really, you know, Marxism is the obvious uh, challenge for, 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 yeah. for his claim. So I suppose my question would be, um, and I think you've talked about this uh, already, or at, at least obliquely, but I wasn't sure if you've uh, I'm not sure if you've put a definitive answer to this, but my question would be, do you think Freud himself uh, would see his own social science, psychological, applied psychology or whatever, um, as a revolutionary science or simply as a descriptive science of the, how things are and there are certain problems for whatever? Yeah. Or does he, like Marx, demand, like, a th like propose a theory which already, um, which isn't only a theory of the society, of the social, but also a theory of the transformation of society. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, so a number of things, thank you, Gregor. Um, you know, to begin with, uh, you all, at uh, the very start of your question reminded me, you know, one thing I wanted to point out is that you know, when I was doing a lot of the research for the for this chapter in particular of of the Infinite Greed book, I really was struck by. I mean, despite over now you know roughly a century of efforts to wed Marxism and psychoanalysis. I mean, going back, for instance, in the early 1920s, in uh, you know pre-Stalinist, so in Lenin's uh, uh, Russia, you know, you had figures like Luria and Vygotsky who were, you know, already engaged in certain efforts to forge interesting links between the two fields. Um, you know, and then of course, soon after, and of course in part, uh, you know, like Reich, one of the early pioneers in, in the Western context, you know, had gone over and visited, take care of Lenin, had gone over and, and visited them in the Soviet Union. Um, you know, you have figures like, uh, you know, Reich and Fenichel, uh, you know, then begin making efforts in this vein too. And of course, most famously, Marcuse and the first generation of the Frankfurt School, uh, you know, carrying out its synthesis or set of syntheses. Um, I was really shocked to find that there was no, despite all of this century of efforts, there was really no sustained Marxist reckoning with the nitty gritty details of, of the later Freud's critiques, in the, especially in these passages that I, I highlighted in my talk. Um, and you know, that alone made me feel like, well, here is you know, sort of a gap to fill. And so a detailed, or a really detailed reckoning with this Freud, not a passing invocation of him um, in this vein. You know, of course, Marcuse repeatedly alludes to these arguments in 1955's Eros and Civilization, but really bearing down on, on, on the text and reckoning with Freud uh, you know, in close quarters uh, was lacking. But that aside, um, What's interesting is, is that, yes, I mean, that line that you, uh, you quoted back about there are only two sciences, uh, you know, psychology, pure and applied, and natural science. Um, I must admit, I, I'm not very sympathetic to that claim by Freud. Um, I think it's a little uh, 
overly simplistic and perhaps uh, rhetorically self-serving at that point for him. But in addition, um, even in some of the other moments of the quotations you know, that are on the handout and that, I, and that I spent time unpacking, I think Freud himself even is a little more subtle and nuanced than this one line would, would indicate, um, where I think here he's being a little, a little unfair to himself almost. Um, because when he makes, when he's a little more sympathetic to Marx and historical materialism, and especially when he says, all right, you've got Marx's historical materialism, which has this scientific, you know, this Wissenschaft this sort of uh, uh, character to it, um, and really the more the problems are the, the, the attempts to translate this into political practice by the likes of the Russian Bolsheviks, um, he seems willing to say that, all right, Marx is, is a real pioneer and, and, and truly an epoch-making figure in pinpointing just how important the domain of the, of the economy in Marx's sense is for hu human societies and their histories and their development. Um, and when he makes those concessions, it's almost so he's willing to say, all right, the problem is just the overemphasis on the economic. And once this is properly tempered, qualified, nuanced, et cetera, by, among other things, psychoanalytic considerations, then this fusion of a more psychological approach with an appreciation of the economy, although I think he plays it such that ultimately he would say psychoanalysis gets to the underlying reasons, motivations, et cetera, for economic history itself, and there would seem to claim a greater degree of primacy. But even there, what's also interesting is, on the flip side, in, you know, and of course, one of the places I'm pulling a lot of this material from is that part of 1933's new introductory lectures on psychoanalysis, the question of a Weltanschauung. And there, he's trying to strike, or at least is, I wouldn't say feigning, but he is certainly um, presenting himself as much more modest and saying, no, no, psychoanalysis is not itself a worldview. It merely partakes of, it participates in, it is you know, an offshoot of the Weltanschauung established by the natural sciences, right? Um, again, we could debate with him about that, but you know, that, that's the general thrust. And there he seems to be saying, to address another part of your question, no, no, you know, psychoanalysis is not itself a revolutionary science. It is a further extension and advancement of a larger, you know, Weltanschauung that is indebted to, to you know, the, the natural sciences going back to their birth in the early 17th century. And I think that's what he's trying to claim. Um, and so if we take all of these things that I've just put on the table into account, um, even if Freud at certain moments, I think, feels threatened by Marx as a kind of competitor, you know, in terms of epoch-making, uh, you know, revolutionary intellectual, you know, significance, I think that the most charitable reading of him and all the nuances of how he articulates his relationship to Marx suggests that he sees Marx as needing psychoanalysis, but psychoanalysis is needing to take into account that indeed some of what Marx has uncovered about economic dimensions in terms of the shaping of societies and their subjects would also have to in some way be taken on board. But he's not very conclusive and we're left to, with a lot of questions and a lot of blanks to fill in as we can, if that helps. Is Anyone else? Ah, oh, Peter. Uh, thank you, Adrian, for this very interesting talk. Uh, you approach many, many topics in a very interesting way. Perhaps I didn't understand uh, well uh, all of your argumentation, so I will just answer some, uh, some things that uh, occurred to me. Either I didn't understand well. Uh, well, the question that Gregor posed to you, uh, I think at the beginning of your lecture when you were talking about Marxism, Marxism at the Freud's time had a similar problem because it was, uh, we say, I don't know what is the proper English expression, but it's basically, it's a transfer of uh, 18th century mechanics into the mm -hmm. Marxist theory. So it's a theory of mirroring. Yes. 
And the problem uh, th that uh, this kind of Marxism understands the relation between infrastructure and sub superstructure yeah. is very simple. And it's in the same way simplistic as uh, Freud approaches this problematic in this one sentence uh, mentioned by Gregor. So on one hand you have this uh, uh, very simple uh, relation between cause and the effect in natural sciences. On the other hand you have this third domain that Freud himself tried to elaborate somehow and the tradition of Western Marxism from Lukács and yep. Frankfurt School somehow tried to develop. Yes. Uh, so in your talk I was, uh, there, are, there, are, there are various uh, uh, ways that you approach these topics that it would be very interesting to follow it, but my question is from simply something else. Uh, I didn't, perhaps I didn't understand you well, but when you were talking about competition, you were saying that capitalist competition somehow originates in infrastructure. Yes. Uh, my question uh, is, uh, goes in two ways. There are many other questions, of course. But um, first, uh, and I think that you already answered this uh, in answering uh, Bar's question, uh, can we talk about competition as such? Yeah. Uh, as, um, as, um, how to say, as, as the same through various stages of capitalism. I don't think so. I think that in later phases, uh, yeah. whatever, uh, neoliberalism or post fordism etc., the relation between infrastructure and superstructure is somehow deranged. So today, uh, and I think that Bara was questioning uh, you this uh, today, even when I'm not working, when I'm not part of the infrastructure, yeah. as a viewer of the TV, I'm producing surplus value. So basically, this relationship is somehow uh, different. Yes. Uh, uh, and my question to you is, don't you think that by simply differentiate, differentiating between capitalist and post-capitalist world, you're somehow, uh, let's say, you, you're not uh, dealing with this, um, let's say, structural, structural change in the history of capitalism, yeah. in the history of the latest capitalism, for, perhaps. Yeah. Um, another question concerns me, uh, concerns the question whether, do you think, and this is a slippery terrain, maybe I didn't understand you well, but the competition is also related, and this is the ABC of, of psychoanalysis, Lacanian psychoanalysis, from the early childhood on, this is the imag imaginary, you know, and the, the, the relation to the object, etc. So yeah. somehow I didn't quite understand where's the place, or let's say Lacan, in this yeah. uh, story you presented. These are huge questions, so you, you didn't, you, yeah. you don't have to answer them uh, extensively, so just a uh, couple of... No, I, and now I'm going to make you sit through my extensive answers. <laughs> no good question goes unpunished. All right, um, so... But, 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 well, but, sorry, both of you, don't forget that um, the bar is still working, so go ahead. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> All right. So I actually want to, uh, you know, before getting to, I think, the really the two nicely formulated questions about the topic of competition, um, to start right where you started, apropos the issue of, for example, the hangover of 18th century mechanistic models in, for instance, certain versions, you know, uh, include, it, it's not just others reading Marx. I mean, it's the case that, I mean, if we look at the infrastructure superstructure distinction, uh, it's, it's no accident that the 1859 preface to contribution to a critique of political economy is also infamous because there, it does seem to be a little too cut and dried, a little too simplistic. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, this point, as you indicate, the problematization of that distinction is most powerfully developed in the Western Marxist tradition, starting with, you know, Lukács, Korsh, et cetera. And indeed, I mean, one way to characterize that whole tradition is, and, you know, Gramsci, of course, as well, is, you know, all sharing a commitment to 
uh, you know, fighting under the banner of superstructure matters, as we might put it, right? Um, and here, uh, what I should say is one of the bigger polemical stakes of the book from which this is taken, and in fact, the entire last chapter of it that brings it to a close is concern, it involves a critical reassessment of not only the Western Marxist tradition from its founders, beginning with the young Lukács, you know, all the way through, you know, to, you know, the third generation of the Frankfurt School, you know, but even, of course, beyond that, you know, figures like Laclau and Mouffe, et cetera. Um, but, you know, this long tradition that Western Marxism is the main uh, uh, representative of, of anti-economism in the history of Marxism. And to, to cut a very long story very short, one of my um, goals in this book is also to push back against that and say the pendulum swang way too far in the other direction. And that, you know, when you have a tradition that calls itself Marxist or even post-Marxist, it goes so far as to say there is no reason whatsoever to privilege the economy at all, period. Um, you know, at that point, you don't need Marx. Um, you could go in for, for instance, Weber. Um, and indeed, I see the Frankfurt School from its beginnings is much more Weberian than, than, than Marxian. Um, and I certainly, you know, I mean, somebody like Leclerc is overt in that, you know, Gramsci is used, you know, in conjunction with Leclerc's appropriations of post-war French theory to essentially break with anything that could be recognizable as distinctive about historical materialism versus other approaches. Um, and I think that the left, both theoretically and practically, has paid some very heavy prices for its neglect of economics. Um, and it's to the point where, you know, you have generations of supposed Marxist theorists who are almost economically illiterate. Um, and who certainly, like if you ask them today about things like, you know, derivatives, et cetera, I mean, the basic elements of how contemporary stock markets, et cetera, function would not even know what you're talking about and have nothing to say. You know, again, to cut a long story short, I think that's a fatal limitation, both you know intellectually and politically. Um, now, as for you know the 18th century mechanics, yes, I think that you know this infrastructure superstructure distinction has to be significantly nuanced. But I think there's still enough in what Marx is trying to bring out, even in the notorious moments like those you know paragraphs in the 1859 preface, that I think have in, have been unfairly discarded in toto um, by European Marxists in the Western context starting in the 1920s. Um, and so that's one of the bigger stakes of the book in terms of a larger debate that this is a part of. But I, you know, here it's almost as though you can work in whether you want to call it a Hegelian or even I might risk say deconstructive fashion where you can deploy the terms but show how they're not as clearly separated as, as it would seem. And of course, with, for instance, toward the end of my talk, the idea of retroactive resublimation, you know, it's the idea that, okay, strictly economic forms of competition, then in a larger context in which there are more than economic forms of competition, which even if originally they're outgrowths or permutations of economic competition, take on a life of their own, and then, in a way that Western Marxists wouldn't, re wouldn't object to, react back on the, those economic forms of competition and make them so that it's really not about the money, et cetera, in the literal, you know, naive sense. Um, that this dynamic of superstructural competition having this, this rebound effect or, you know, reacting back upon whether we want to say it's, it, it, uh, the infrastructural forms or its origins or not, opens up the possibility for you know, a non-utopian, you know, very sober realist, okay, we're not gonna cure people of some of this, at least not for a long time, but there, this is not an insurmountable barrier to things like privatization of the, I mean, I'm sorry, <laughs> That's a weird slip. Um, Deprivatization of the means of production, thank you. <clears throat> Uh, I, maybe I do have a horrible capitalist id. It sunk down, not even to the super ego, but it's not, anyhow. Um, all right, now let me cut to the chase and, get, and deal with these two, these two questions about competition. Um, yeah, I think, I haven't reflected on it, but I think you're right, you know, it, it, the, the very word competition as a singular term for all of these things might be somewhat inadequate. But um, nonetheless, you know, if we think about it in terms of some kind of self-interested, um, you know, whether we want to qualify it as narcissistic, as, as uh, you know, et cetera, you know, that there's certainly 
there's a, a, there's a je ne sais quoi as a lowest common denominator, at least in capitalist societies, to these various manifestations. And of course, when you think about how we even talk about more than economic parts of our lives, take, you know, for a long time in English, and I don't know if it's the same in Slovene, you know, when you talk about going on the meat market, you know, when you're looking for a new partner, you know, in terms of sex and love, I mean, things like this, um, where we even use the very language of the economic sphere to characterize, you know, especially in the United States, to characterize different aspects of our lives. And even non-Marxists have gone very far in this direction, too. I mean, when you think about, like, Foucault's work and the Collège de France lectures on the entrepreneurship of the self, etc. cetera. Um, he, he's picking up on some of this too. And like you pointed out, okay, yeah, when I'm at work during the day and I'm on the clock and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm earning my, my living, you know, it's economic. I go home at night, watch television, et cetera. Um, and, you know, part of my point is that I think our economic competition is closer to that non-economic form or is, or is colored by it for us libidinally in a way that, again, would allow us to say, we don't need to be doing this in the sphere of the economy anymore to scratch those itches. Uh, we have these other outlets. Um, and then, yeah, the, the, the second competition question, though, um, you know, where I think quite, uh, quite appropriately you bring up, especially Lacan's notion of imaginary rivalry as, you know, Again, uh, not something which is peculiar to just, say, the capitalist period of social history. Um, you know, those sorts of things, again, what I'm trying to do is show how you could grant, you know, not just Freud's, you know, more pessimistic or dark assessments of us, but Lacan's too, but still that concession by no means involves capitulating to a version of the pro-capitalist human nature argument against Marxism, right? So I suppose that would be the most succinct way I could put it. Am I off the hook now? <laughs> yes, Sasafi, pour maintenant. I assume this was the last question or if there is anyone else that... I assume not. So thanks, Adrian, again. No, thanks. thank you. And also All for engaging in Q&A section and for really, for a great, great talk. And uh, for all those who are interested, uh, Adrian is giving another talk on Monday uh, at the Institute, third floor, uh, on Lacan and Pascal. Uh, 5 p.m. And that one is drawn from the uh, God is Undead psychoanalysis between agnosticism and atheism project I'm doing with Lorenzo Keyes. So, so something, have, something, not Money Python was saying now for something completely yeah, different. Yeah, so you'll basically have a chance to uh, listen to the material from two uh, new, new books uh, Adrian is uh, working on. So thanks again. Thank you, and thank all of you, really.